Now we come to the rare adverse effects of levodopa. There is midriasis leading to precipitation of glaucoma. If the patient suffers from glaucoma, there can be precipitation of gout. And if L-dopa is abruptly stopped, it could lead to neuroleptic malignant syndrome. The positive Coombs test leading to hemolysis, smell and test abnormalities, elevation of liver enzymes and the blood urea nitrogen. Due to all these rare adverse effects, we need to take precautions if the patient is suffering from ischemic heart disease or cerebrovascular disease, obviously gout, peptic ulcer, psychiatric illnesses and glaucoma. Or if the patient has a very severe renal or hepatic disease. So the contraindications to levodopa obviously is the patient with psychosis because it's going to lead to the excess of dopamine. Narrow angle glaucoma will be a contraindication. Patient with arrhythmias will be a contraindication and melanoma because L-dopa is the precursor of skin melanin. What are the interactions of levodopa? This is very interesting. If the patient is receiving vitamin supplements in the form of large doses of vitamin B6, pyridoxine, then this pyridoxine can stimulate or activate the enzyme peripheral dopa decarboxylase. Because this peripheral dopa decarboxylase is dependent on vitamin B6, B6 works as a cofactor. So more B6, more dopa decarboxylase, more breakdown of dopamine. This is going to lead to decreased efficacy of your levodopa. Next, levodopa is a drug which is dopamine precursor, is going to add dopamine. And in this situation, if the patient receives D2 blockers, like the neuroleptics or antipsychotic drugs, it's exactly the opposite effect. So it's going to reverse the effect of levodopa. Next, as you know, levodopa is going to lead to formation of dopamine and we already said it leads to postural hypotension, hypotension and if you use antihypertensive drugs in this situation, it is going to lead to more hypertension, so the postural hypertension is going to get aggravated. Next, if the patient receives non-selective MAO inhibitors, that is monoamine oxidase inhibitors, which are going to inhibit the breakdown of amines then it's going to block the degradation of dopamine and norepinephrine in the periphery. So the amines are going to accumulate. Plus you are giving levodopa it is going to lead to more amines and this could lead to increase in the blood pressure. Next, the proteins in our meals, they compete for absorption with levodopa. And it's better to give levodopa half an hour before meals so that there's no drug interaction at the level of absorption. So there are some very important and interesting interactions of L-DOPA. Now, if L-DOPA is used alone, the miracle is, before reaching the brain, almost 95% of the levodopa gets metabolized in the periphery. And we have seen two enzymes, COMT and the dopa decarboxylase. It is going to break down almost 95% of levodopa in the periphery and we are going to get only 5% of levodopa inside the brain. We need to do something for this. What do we do? We add a substance called carbidopa to this particular levodopa. So these are the drugs which are called peripheral dopa decarboxylase inhibitors. They are going to inhibit the peripheral breakdown of levodopa by the enzyme dopa decarboxylase and the drugs are carbidopa and benzodiazepine. So what's going to happen is conversion of levodopa into dopamine in the periphery by the dopa decarboxylase is going to be inhibited and more levodopa will be intact and will be available for entry into the brain so this is going to concentrate levodopa in the brain please remember carbidopa and benzodiazepine they do not cross blood brain barrier mind well they don't have to cross if they cross the blood brain barrier and go inside hand in hand with levodopa they are going to do the same thing inside the brain which they are going to do outside. That is the inhibition of the dopa decarboxylase enzyme. So what would happen inside is dopa decarboxylase enzyme will be inhibited and levodopa will not get converted into dopamine. So it is going to be useless. They should not cross the blood brain barrier and they do not cross the blood brain barrier. So the peripheral dopa decarboxylase inhibitors, carbidopa and benzodiazepine, and that's why I'm calling them peripheral dopa decarboxylase inhibitors. They don't cross the blood brain barrier and they don't inhibit the dopa decarboxylase inside the brain. The combination of L-dopa and carbidopa or L-dopa and benzodiazepine produces drug synergism. 
Look at the combinations. 100 milligrams of L-DOPA and 10 milligrams of carbidopa is combined. 250 of L-DOPA and 25 of carbidopa. So the ratio is 10 parts of levodopa to one part of carbidopa. This is one one way. The second way is 100 milligrams of L-DOPA and 25 of carbidopa. That's four parts of levodopa and one part of carbidopa. This is also available. And lastly, in the same ratio, that's 100 L-DOPA, benzoracid is also available. That's 25 milligrams of benzoracid. In general, the requirement for the patient is likely to be 400 to 800 milligrams per day of levodopa. For carbidopa, it's about 75 to 100 milligrams every day. And for benzoracid, it's about 100 to 200 milligrams per day. This would approximately come to two to three tablets given three to four times a day and remember one hour before meals so as to avoid the drug interaction with the proteins. Usually we start with the combination 2500 and later we shift to 1000 combination. The combination of L-DOPA and carbidopa is called co carol dopa and let's have a look at the advantages. We already said carbidopa is going to inhibit the peripheral metabolism of levodopa so more L-DOPA is going to be available. So advantages, there is decrease in the dose requirement of levodopa. The dose required decreases by about one fourth. So that's a great achievement. There is more bioavailability of levodopa and a longer T half of L-DOPA. There is less nausea and vomiting due to less peripheral dopamine and there are less cardiac complications. The on-off phenomena are less as compared to using L-DOPA alone. The tolerance to levodopa gets delayed. We already said L-DOPA produces tolerance on long-term use. Now since we are going to begin the levodopa in a smaller dose, the tolerance is obviously going to be delayed and the patient shows better compliance. So there are many advantages and lastly, the interaction with pyridoxine is going to be minimized because we are already inhibiting the enzyme dopantycarboxylase. With all these advantages, there are certain areas on which L-DOPA carbidopa combination doesn't work. What are the problems which are not minimized by this combination? Number one, involuntary movements are not minimized. They remain as they are. Behavioral abnormalities, they are not much affected. And the postural hypertension is also not much affected. I think you will always learn by heart the advantages of the combination and miss the disadvantages or the problems which are not overcome. So please remember three things. Problems which are not overcome, not minimized by L-DOPA carbidopa combination is involuntary movements, behavioral abnormalities and the postural hypertension. So that's about L-DOPA carbidopa. And now we move on to direct dopaminergic agonists. We have ergot derivatives, bromocryptin, cabergolin and others and non-ergot derivatives, the newer drugs, ropinirol and pramipexol. These are direct dopaminergic agonists. We mean to say that they directly stimulate the D2 receptors and they help the action of levodopa. These drugs do decrease the dose requirement of L-DOPA. They don't have any need of metabolic activation and they don't depend much on the functional integrity of the nigrostriatal neurons. They have a longer duration of action and they produce less on-off phenomena and there's minimal generation of free radicals. As you know, the metabolic products of dopamine can produce free radicals. If you use direct DE agonist, it's going to be less. Let's compare in this table, bromocryptin and others, the older ones on one side and ropinirol primipixol on the other side. Bromocryptin is older and ergot derivative. Ropinirol primipixol are newer non-ergot substances. Bromocryptin and others, they are mainly partial D2 agonist and D3, D4 agonist and weak D1 agonist antagonist. Ropinirol primipixol are more selective on the D2 and D3 receptors and there's least action on D1 receptors. Bromocryptin has a short action and slow response. Ropinirol primipixol have got a rapid response and a longer action. And look at both the sides. Both of them can be used as adjunct in late or advanced stages of Parkinson. Bromocryptin as well as the newer drugs. They can be used as adjuncts in the late or advanced stages of Parkinson. In addition to this, the newer agents, ropinirol primipixol, can be also used as monotherapy in the early disease, especially in the young patients. It's a first choice. And ropinirol is also useful for restless leg syndromes. 
bromocryptin it has got some other uses apart from parkinson adjunct in late or advanced stages of parkinson disease as such we already said in addition it's useful very useful for drug induced parkinson is useful for hyperprolactinemia galactoria syndrome and acromegaly and is also useful for neuroleptic malignant syndrome as far as the adverse effects are concerned bromocryptin and others they are more toxic they are less tolerated and ropinirol pamipexol are better tolerated bromocryptin produces anorexia nausea vomiting vertigo etc with ropinirol pamipexol also we get prominent nausea and dizziness dizziness is very typical there is daytime sleepiness and tendency to fall asleep with ropinirol and pamipexol we come to the other side bromocryptin produces partial hypotension and nasal and conjunctival injection and both the drugs bromocryptin as well as the newer drugs both of them see on the both the sides both of them they produce hallucinations and confusion there's one adverse effect which is very typical to bromocryptin and that's digital vasospasm leading to gangrene also erythromelalgia that's affecting the joints of the feet and hands and peripheral edema and pleural fibrosis all these things are not much seen with ropinirol and pamipexol so after da agonist we discuss the comp inhibitors that's tolcapone or entacapone i remind you of the breakdown of levodopa once again levodopa gets broken down by the peripheral comp into 3o methyl dopa so if the peripheral comp enzyme is present some l dopa is going to get lost by conversion into 3o methyl dopa so when we use comp inhibitors more l dopa is going to enter the brain and this is going to increase the l dopa efficacy when carbidopa will inhibit the dopa decarboxylase enzyme the l dopa gets diverted to comp and this formation of 3o methyl dopa which is going to compete again with l dopa for brain entry so if you use comp inhibitors all this is going to get affected and more do- levodopa is going to enter comp inhibition helps more l dopa to go inside that's the gist of whatever we discussed about the breakdown and there's less on off phenomena and there's prolonged on time when comp inhibitors are used they are tolcapone and entercapone their half life is 2 hours entercapone acts only peripherally and it is less hepatotoxic so entercapone is preferred the second agent that's tolcapone acts on the brain as well as periphery is more potent and has long duration but it's hepatotoxic so tolcapone is less preferred once again to say entercapone acts only peripherally less hepatotoxic and this is preferred tolcapone acts on the brain as well as periphery and it is hepatotoxic so it's less preferred the other adverse effects which are common to both the agents are dyskinesia sleep disturbances nausea diarrhea and postural hypotension next group is selective irreversible mao b inhibitors in the form of selegilin or rasagilin i hope you understand the mechanism of action monoamine oxidase inhibitors so they are going to inhibit the breakdown of dopamine in the dopaminergic neurons they can be used in early stage of parkinson they can sometimes be also used as monotherapy in the late stage it could be used with l dopa carbidopa and they decrease the requirement of levodopa they decrease the involuntary movements or dyskinesias and when they are used in higher doses or used with tcas or ssri it will lead to amine excess and would lead to cheese reaction can also lead to serotonin syndrome 